Start with number 49 this morning. Number 49. And once you find it, um, the way we'll do this one, it gets kind of long if we sing the chorus every time. We'll sing the first and second verses, just the verses by themselves, and then sing the chorus. And then we'll do the same thing with the third and fourth verses, just sing both of those back to back. And then the chorus, and then we'll just do the fifth verse and chorus like normal. So first one and two, then the chorus, three and four, then the chorus, and then five, just like normal. Number 49. Two, back to back, no chorus. Three and four, back to back, no chorus. Then the chorus. Sorry. So I'll say it, I'll say it again. It's early. I get it. So one and two, just the verses. Back to back, no chorus until after the second verse. I'll say it that way. And then three and four, just no chorus until after the fourth verse. So let's just start on the second verse. Go straight into the chorus. If this doesn't work again, we'll just sing it all the way through. <laughs> so. Number 49 on the second verse, ready? Jesus, what a strength in weakness Let me hide myself in him Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing Be my strength, my victory granted me forgiveness I'm his and he is mine that's good I like that let's start off with a word of prayer um, brother Matt would you pray for us this morning please Hi, my father thank you for the time that we have uh, today and thanks for blessing all of our travels in and keeping us safe and mm-hmm. please bless the message that we get today and that will be helpful for all of us here and to bring us into the next week and just please be with us and be in our church today and guide the pastor and what he needs to say. And I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
All right, let's turn to number 451. 451. Four sixty six. Back a few pages, number four sixty six. Thank you. 
this morning, uh, Wednesday. <clears throat> um, we stopped at page 134, so we'll have lessons six questions answered and memorize Psalm 119.11. And uh, Sunday lunch, next Sunday after the AM service, the theme will be Asian food. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> Spicy, huh? Okay. Um, note, if your name is not Sawyer Tome, do not touch the soundboard, please. <laughs> and uh, camp, make sure your papers are filled out for each teen attending teen camp. And then this Wednesday, we need to stack chairs for carpet cleaning. Do we have a time for that? Or? After service. After service, okay. All right. Do we have a special? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leading on a special book. Uh, one additional announcement. Keep Brother Kurt's uh, friend in prayer uh, for health, recovery, uh, mental, emotional, all the things that go along with uh, that situation, but please remember to keep him in prayer. Uh, I'm kind of debating a special. I'm going to do it. Let's do a special. It'll only be one song. We'll sing one more after this. who uh, didn't get saved till later in life and appreciated the cleansing power of the blood. I got saved when I was six, so I didn't go through a whole life of uh, debauchery and sin, just stealing cookies out of the Tupperware in the cabinet on the second shelf there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's like some of us that got saved when we were younger, all our backsliding took place after we were saved. And uh, I'm still thankful for the cleansing, cleansing power of the blood. Dark the stain that soiled man's nature on the distance that he fell. Far removed from home and heaven into deep despair and hell. But there was a fountain the blood of God's own Son purifies the soul and reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Conscious of the deep pollution, sinners wander in the night, though they hear the shepherd calling, still they fear the light, this the blessed consolation that can melt a heart of stone, that sweet balm of Gilead reaches deeper than the stain has gone, praise the Lord for full salvation, God still reigns upon the throne. And I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. All unworthy we who've wandered, and our eyes are wet with tears, as we think of the love 
love that sought us through the weary wasted years yet we walk a holy highway walking by God's grace alone and knowing Calvary's fountain reaches deeper When with holy choirs we're standing in the presence of the King, and our souls are lost in wonder as the white robed choirs sing, then we'll praise the name of Jesus with the millions round. reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Praise the Lord for full salvation. God still reigns upon the throne. And I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain. Turn to number 332 in the Blue Hymn Book, 332 for the preaching this morning. to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we will be there for the majority of the message today. Matthew 6. I'll read a couple verses and get right to the topic this morning. If 
you're taking notes or if you want to get a bookmark out, I plan to turn to one other reference in 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, if you want to put a bookmark there, it'll be a few minutes before we get there. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Oh, it's good to be springtimey again. Man. I try not to comment on the weather a whole lot, but my world revolves around it a little bit during the summertime, and, uh, and in the wintertime I'm stuck indoors. So uh, I'm thankful to be outside and be able to uh, just enjoy the normal temperatures without shivering or wondering, why am I getting frustrated and my fingers are numb? And uh, it uh, sure is good to see some things growing again. Some buds on the trees a little bit. Uh, somebody put some plants all over in here, and I appreciate it. I would never do it, but I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 6. There are some things to consider in these verses we're going to read, starting in verse 24. We cannot preach on all of the things to consider here, so I'm going to narrow it down to one, one thing I would like to consider this morning. But let's start in verse 24 and get a little Bible reading in. We'll read to the end of the chapter. Matthew 6 and verse 24, no man can serve two masters. Amen? Amen. You can serve one and you better pick the right one. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve, God uses the example, God and mammon. We know that mammon is money, uh, generally speaking. Verse 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink nor yet for your body what you shall put on. You say, isn't this a little extreme? There's a lot of extreme things in the Bible. You say, I should never consider what I eat. I would starve to death. No, it doesn't mean that. No thought does not mean don't ever eat a meal. It doesn't mean that. Let's read to the end and get our context. Take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, there's your clothing, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat? Can we agree with that part? Without all of our context figured out yet, the life is more than what you put in your put in your face. And the body, then raiment, is your body more important than the fashion of the age of today? I should, I should sure hope so. Verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? The Lord says, I want you to consider, number one, your service in verse 24. I want you to consider your sustenance in verse 26. The fowls, they don't gather a bunch of food and store it up in barns. The Lord says, I'll take care of your sustenance. Think about the birds. I take care of them, don't I? Are you not much more valuable than many sparrows? He said in the book of Luke. Your service, your sustenance, look at your strength in verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Hasn't every person that's shorter than the average American height said, I wish I was taller? Hasn't everybody said that? And you say, man, I wish I was a cubit taller, then I'd be a giant and I could just be in charge and tell everybody what to do and I'd, I'd be unstoppable. <laughs> Not by 55 grains traveling at 200 and, you know, 2,800 feet per second, you wouldn't. You say, I, th I think if I were taller, I'd have more strength. You ever met the gentle giant, the guy that on the basketball team is just the tallest guy but would never, you know, pound anybody into the ground because he just doesn't have the personality for it? Those things come with a trade-off, and the Lord says you should consider your strength or your stature. Verse 28, you should consider your survival. Verse 28, and why take you thought for raiment? That's your food, clothing, and shelter. Now we've got to shelter. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. They don't stitch clothing together, those lilies. And yet, even though they don't make their own clothes, yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The most fashionable person on a magazine cover you've ever seen is not arrayed as beautiful and as glorious as the lilies of the field. You should consider your survival or your shelter here. It's not as important as beauty as you think, and the Lord can provide some beauty that you can't provide. Verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe, talking about clothing, the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Take thought, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? There's your food. Or what we shall drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? Your sustenance. Verse 
uh, 32 and your survival, but consider, uh, well, let me read two more verses and then one more consider. 32, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, 34, consider your sorrows. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. What is the morrow full of? A bunch of evil. What is today full of? A bunch of evil. Sufficient. It means it's enough. It means it's filled up. Sufficient unto the day. What day are we talking about? Tomorrow. Sufficient unto that day, the tomorrow day, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Thereof what? Of this day. In other words, there's enough evil today to worry about without worrying about all the evil of tomorrow. And what should you consider? You should consider your sorrows. You should consider that man will go through sorrows and man will not escape this life without going through sorrows. And Jesus Christ never sinned one time and still suffered sorrows. You should consider your sorrows. You say, what should we consider about all these things? Did you notice in verse 34 it said, no thought? In verse 31 it said, take no thought. In verse 28 it said, and why take ye thought? In verse 27 it says, and which of you by taking thought? Did you notice how many of them there were? Verse 25, take no thought. You know what the Lord wants control of in your life? He wants control of your thoughts. Where does he want your thoughts? He told you in verse 33. What's the fourth word in the verse? But seek ye first. He didn't say don't eat. He didn't say don't wear nice clothes. Right? He didn't say you are not allowed to drive a car with leather seats. I like leather seats. They're easy to clean when kids make a mess in your vehicle. I wish all my vehicles had leather seats. I've just been blessed with one. You say you can't have nice things because you're a Baptist preacher. I can have nice things. You know why? Because I sought first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And then what does the Lord do? All, I don't know ah, if I can even say it. All these things <clears throat> shall be added unto you. When you put the Lord first, you know what he does? He brings a lot of blessings with it. When you seek first the kingdom of God, you say, when did you seek first the kingdom of God? The day I got saved. The day I got saved, I put the Lord Jesus Christ first ahead of myself and my pride and my own thinking and I said, Lord, I want to trust you as my Savior. I want to part in that spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. And the day I did that, I put the Lord first. You know what I had to do the next day? I had to put the Lord first. You know what I had to do 10 years later? I had to put the Lord first. You know what I have to do now, 25 years later? I had to put the Lord first. Keep putting the Lord first and all these things. What things? The things that the Gentiles seek after, the physical things things of life. You know what you put first? You put the Lord first and the physical things of life will take care of themselves and all the evil that comes with it is sufficient today for you to be able to handle without worrying about the evil of tomorrow that you will be able to handle when it's time to handle it. I want to preach on considering one thing in this text here. In verse 28 it says, And why take you thought for the raiment, for your clothes, Jesus Christ, the words of the mouth of Jesus Christ said, Consider the lilies. Consider the lilies of the field. You know, I uh, read a book on lilies one time, and I thought I should read this book because I've never stopped and considered the lilies. I like flowers. I don't despise flowers. I don't go out of my way to find I don't wear flowery prints or Paisley? Is paisley a flower, or what is those squirrely ties that look like a blob on one end and a curled, you know, particular <laughs> spiral curve of the, you know, some geometrical calculus equation? I've tried to wear the paisley tie, and I just, they don't, they're not me, and I'm not them. And uh, I don't have anything particularly against the color pink or purple, but it's just not what I choose to wear. But I sure do enjoy a sunset that has some vibrant colors in it, don't I? Don't you? In the first page of this book, it said, The flowers shown in this guide can only include a sample of the seemingly endless array in our natural world. And I read the same words in the scripture when I opened up to Matthew 6, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed 
like one of these. I looked up another place and they said Lily's colors can include a vast array of nearly every color except true blue. They're described as pretty, striking, gorgeous, lavish in color. A single flower can range from red to orange to yellow. Another will be white, pink, purple, and blue. The stargazer is a vibrant pink. The pink twinkle lily is a glowing coral pink. The orange art hybrid lily is a neon pumpkin orange. Uh, some of you ladies might know what that means. Us men are not even sure how you get neon and pumpkins together. But I'll bet they sell it at Sherwin-Williams. I'm sure it's there. The coral lily has tiny sparks of saffron. Again, what saffron is, I don't know. And the martagon lily is a sparkling white. The lilies have a, vi a, a vibrant color uh, spectrum, and they also have quite a fragrant spectrum. Many have strong scents, and others have nearly no scent at all. Some can only be smelled by a very sensitive nose. The varieties of those flowers extend to 90 in the species section, kingdom phylum class, whatever all that is. Species, there's 90 of them, not including the hybrids. They have a color, they have a wide variety of fragrance. But the verse said in verse 20, 28, it said, consider the lilies how they grow. I want to consider the lilies this morning. Lord, I ask that you would please uh, bless the words of this message. Lord, I ask you please uh, help us to come to you this morning cleansed and uh, washed in your blood and ready to hear from you. Uh, Lord, I ask you cleanse us from secret sins. I ask you cleanse us from the sins of this week and the known sins that uh, we bring before you, Lord. I ask you to help us to come to you uh, ready to hear from you and able to communicate and sup and fellowship and eat and uh, enjoy your presence this morning. Lord, I ask you please speak to somebody today. I ask you please help somebody. This is not a uh, rebuking type of message, Lord. I ask that it be a help and encouragement, a springtime uh, fitting message for, for the season. I ask you to help us to remember uh, some things about these lilies that compare over and over to ourselves. I ask you please bless the message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get into this topic here, we're going through the book of Matthew occasionally in the afternoon service. In the book of Matthew was uh, a lot of recordings of Jesus Christ on the earth, speaking to Jewish disciples who were living under the Old Testament law. Is that, is that easy enough to understand? Since the book of Matthew, Jesus died on the cross, he was buried in a tomb, and he rose again, and then this thing started called the church. And the church was not the church back in Jesus' day. The church is a different thing that the Lord's really pleased with. He's really excited about it, whether Billings is or not. <laughs> He's really excited about the church and what it means. You say, I know all the church and all its problems. I could tell you more than you could tell me. I guarantee it. <laughs> I could tell you all kinds of problems, but I could tell you this. At the end of the whole list of your problems and mine, I could tell you this, that the Lord chose the church, and what man has done to ruin it did not negate God's desire to find pleasure in it. And the Lord loves his church. Now, who is this lily in the book of Matthew? Well, if you want to get technical, if you want to get doctrinal, this is the only doctrinally technical part of the message today, but uh, the lily is technically, doctrinally, he's an Israelite. Hosea 14.5, I will be as the dew unto Israel, he shall grow as the lily. He's an Israelite specifically in the tribulation that must be dependent on God for his survival. This uh, lily of the field is surrounded by the grass. We saw that in verse 30. What is the grass in the Bible? The grass over and over is called the field is the world in Matthew 13. The grass pictures lost men. How do you know they're lost men? Because he told you that the, the oven is the sun that shows up and burns up all the grass of the field. What happens to lost men? The sun of righteousness shall arise and he's going to burn up lost men and tell the angels, bind them hand and foot and cast them into the lake of fire. Why? Because they're lost men and they are like grass. All flesh is grass, Isaiah 40, 1 Peter 1, 24. The one day that they're burned up in the fiery oven in the time of God's anger, Psalm 21, verse 9, that day cometh that shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, Psalm 2, 2. Malachi 4, he's going to gather them up, Song of Solomon 6. He's going to gather those lilies together, Song of Solomon 6, and they are going to keep their grace and their fashion. So what happens when the sun shows up? Well, the sun is a destruction to the grass, and the sun gives life and health and radiance to the lily. What's the Israelite? The Israelite is sustaining on God's sunlight, and the world is being burned up. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat 
but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace and the fashion of it perisheth, so shall the rich man fade away in his ways. I said the lily is a type of the tribulation Jew. How do you get rich in the tribulation? You take the mark, and you go along with the system, right? And you become wealthy, and the rich men are evil in the tribulation. Rich men are not just evil today because they're rich. Those rich references in the Bible generally are speaking of men in the tribulation who have gone along with the Antichrist and the beast system. James 1, again, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life. What does he have to do? Well, he can't toil or spin, like the lily doesn't toil, neither do they spin. He can't toil or spin in the tribulation, because if he worked, he'd be under the Gentile system. If he was under the Gentile system, having the beast and the false prophet and the, uh, the devil that controls the economy with the mark of the beast, uh, then he would have to go along with their system to survive. But in the end, Matthew 5, verse 6, says they that suffer, uh, they that uh, uh, hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And the Lord takes care of them. And he says in Revelation 7, tribulation passage, neither will the sun light on them nor any heat was the lily picture. It pictures a supernatural protection of God taking care of something growing in a field surrounded by grass, just plain old grass that doesn't bring the pleasure to God that the beautiful lily brings to God. Why did he put that, uh, that lily out there in the middle of the mountains and the alpine levels, all these lily family flowers out there? I'll read a couple of them in a minute. Why did he put those out there at 9 and 10 and 11,000 feet where nobody will ever pass by once in 10 years, some backpacker might get lost and, and see this lily on the field that nobody ever sees. Why did he put them there? The Lord said, consider the lilies. You say, I am so insignificant and small, who even knows who I am? The Lord made you, and if you're saved, the Lord gets a special pleasure out of you that he does not find in the grass of the field. Number one, I want you to consider their frailty. Number one, consider the frailty of the lily. In the book, I found these words describing lilies. Small, dainty, delicate. That was the first thing that reached out and slapped me off the pages of this D. Strickland book on lilies. Consider the lilies, Isaac. Small, dainty, delicate. Do you know what you are, men? Small, dainty, delicate. Women might not mind that description as much as a man, but that's what you are. You are fragile. You know how the lilies grow? It said consider their frailty. Well, depending on the type of lily and the temperature of the area and the climate uh, and the soil conditions, those lilies have to be planted in the ground 8 to 14 inches deep. Some of those stems are so dainty and delicate that they're not hardy enough to hold up their own flowers. So they grow up really tall if they have the moisture, and then because of the weight of the flower on the top, they have to have a little stake and little twisty ties or whatever you do to hold them up in place. You know, isn't that like some Christians? Look at how pretty I am. Look at me. I'm a Christian. I'm just on fire for God. And you know what you need, and you might not realize it. You get too big in the head, right? And what happens? <laughs> lean on me. <laughs> when you're not strong, I need someone to lean on because I have to admit I have a big head. Why? Because there will be people in the body of Christ that you need to help you, right? Even though you have this uh, um, great amount of beauty and an uh, added cubit to your stature and you're just this, you know, God's favorite child. You know what lilies have? They have stems that sometimes cannot bear their own weight. Lilies have a dormant season. What do we have for the last three, four, five, six months around here? The lilies grow around the clock during the growing season. I mean, they're already popping out of the snow. They have snow on them in some of the, you know, sometimes we're walking along and patch of snow, lily, lily, lily out there in the bear tooths. They start growing in March, April, May, in the alpine heights in May and June when it's still cold and you can still find snow, and they grow all the way to the end of the season. June, July, August, even into September, you can find lilies. But all lilies and all Christians have a dormant season where there is no visible growth taking place. Isaac, what do you think about this certain church member and what did they actually do? and How have they actually been growing? I don't know. Well, you're the pastor, aren't you supposed to know? 
I don't know, and, and I'm not real worried about it either. Do you know why? Because everybody has a dormant season. If you don't have a dormant season, you never have a re time of recovery, you're never going to grow. Ask anybody that goes to the gym and lifts weights. You do not get stronger when you walk out of the gym. You get strong on day two and three and four and five after your muscles have time to recover. And then the following week or two weeks later, you're able to increase the amount of, that you lift or the endurance that you're after. Why? Because of a dormant time of recovery. You know, some Christians go through dormant times and they go through almost like a seasonal growth and it can almost match the seasons of the year where summertime is get after it, let's work, 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 and then fall time, let's get everything into the barn, so to speak, right? Wrapping up the last minute things and it's time to really push hard and then wintertime comes and I just need a break. I need a fireplace and a good book. That's what I need. You say, well, you're just being lazy. Or you're getting some rest and going through a dormant stage. I go through these in my life, I've lived long enough to observe them, and I've lived long enough also to not fight them. When you have a dormant stage, uh, why don't you just consider the last five years of your life and consider, am I lazy or am I recovering? And you know, you know. Some Christians don't take enough time for a dormant stage with no visible growth because they're so worried about results and reports and people to tell how much they accomplished that they're trying to impress the wrong person instead of impressing the Lord. They're impressing a bunch of men who put on them some standard they're unable to bear. You do not have to impress me as your pastor. If the Lord puts on you a time of rest, take the rest. I preached about six sermons in a row last year on rest, and I thought, you know what? Maybe I'm just preaching to myself and I should quit yelling at everybody else about rest and I should just get some rest. I did a whole lot of nothing this winter and I'm not one bit ashamed of it. I did a whole lot of nothing. And about halfway through the whole lot of nothing, I came to the thought, you know, when I get this antsy feeling of it's time to go, I got to get back to work. I'm going to wait till that feeling comes. Because I've been old enough to have that sense and have that feeling, right? So I... Rested <laughs> this winter. I studied and wrote and read and, and did the normal things and did a couple little jobs here and there, but mainly rested. And then what happened? Oh, about two weeks ago, I got this, I got to get moving. I got to go. It is time to go. And now it's time to go. It's time to get back to work. What are you going to do? Fight the dormant season and burn yourself out and ruin your back? We, all of us, people older than 30, have probably experienced that. You're going to throw your back out, and the Lord's going to say, I've been telling you to get some rest for two, three months now, and you pushed it to the limit, and you broke the equipment down because you failed to maintain your equipment, soldier. <laughs> all equipment requires maintenance. All equipment requires shop time. It's rest. It's a dormant season. And you don't judge the equipment when it's in the shop. You judge it when it's supposed to be operating on its normal schedule. Number two, after you've considered its frailty, you should consider the lily's field. You should consider the field. You know, the lilies grow in different types of environments. I looked up some lilies where I grew up back home in Ohio. The lilies native to Ohio are the wood lily. If I said these names, every woman in the church in Ohio would, would know these particular lilies back east. They grow in uh, Indiana and Illinois, Michigan, maybe even a further west. But uh, the, there's the Michigan lily. It grows five feet tall with a smooth, unbraided stem, unbranched stem. Uh, and uh, half of Ohio, these lilies are orange-red. Many of them have brown dots. If you've ever seen these back east, they're everywhere. Uh, they have a Turk's cap lily. It's six feet tall. Northeastern Ohio, they're similar to the Michigan lily, but they have a green star at the base, and inside the corolla, they have a more yellow-orange color. There's the Canada lily. It grows tall again, orange and brown and dark, but red tips on the petals. The flowers hang straight down like a chandelier. In most areas, the, they grow in moist areas, savannas, and you see them along the roadsides. You know, we don't have those lilies out west. You know what kind of lilies they have back east? They have back east lilies. <laughs> they have lilies that grow in swampy, squishy ground. Every morning I would walk out in my tennis shoes and soak my shoes if I had to walk through the grass and say, man, I forgot again about the dew that just blankets the ground back east in those early mornings in the summer. 
There's so much moisture there. What happens? The lilies grow five and six foot tall. You know what type of girlies, lilies grow out west? The Douglas Brodasia lily. It prefers the, prefers the grassy prairies. The sago lily, that's the Utah state flower, if you've ever seen that. They grow up medium elevations in open forest and grassy prairies. The blue camus lily is a vegetable staple of the Indians before we uh, moved in here and took all their tents. They have a starchy bulb, and they would eat that starchy bulb underneath the soil. And where does it grow? Moist meadows and grassy sagebrush flats. William Clark came to a clearing and he all looked across the valley and he said, when I saw the blue camus lily at first sight, I would have sworn it was water. Just a sea of blue camus lilies. Mm -hmm. There's the yellow bell lily and the star lily. They grow in sagebrush, sagebrush deserts. What is their field? The field that God puts you in is the field that you'll grow best in. You take a back east lily and grow it here and it won't grow six feet tall, it'll die because you don't have that dew every morning and you don't have that rain every afternoon three weeks, three days out of the week. You know what the Lord did out west? He put some different lilies that could handle their field where they're supposed to be. And some people have a very moist field and some people have a very dry field that they're called to minister in. You say, are you talking to preachers about ministry? No, I believe every Christian has a ministry. I believe every Christian has a place that he can minister to his friends to his family, to his neighbors, to his co-workers. I believe that everybody has a ministry. I talked to a preacher recently, and I said, Brother, how do you do uh, door knocking? He said, since COVID hit, door knocking wasn't acceptable in our community, big city community, before COVID. And then after COVID, he said, Brother, we can't do that here in our community. He said, but you know what I found out is that we had, for the last couple of years, have been missing one of the greatest communities in our area, we've just been completely overlooking the community of people that we can minister at our co-workers' place, our co-workers who see you read your Bible and see you pray and know your schedule and know that you go to church every Sunday and know your testimony of not cussing and laughing at the jokes. They know who you are and you're missing out on a great field of an opportunity Instead of saying, I'm going to do it like 1972, we have to be knocking this many doors and getting this many people on the bus. I think that's a good ministry, if that's the field God puts you in. And I think the ministry for you is the ministry where you have a field full of grass that is supposed to be a lily pleasing to the Lord. What's their field? Some are moist and some are dry. Out here, they're dry, surrounded by grass and sagebrush and thickets and undergrowth. And God puts different men in different fields, and he gives them the ability to grow and sustain off of the moisture that they have. You say, I would like more moisture. You don't get more moisture. You live out west. You don't get it. You can get creative, but you don't get the moisture. God will give you some different personalities and experiences and spiritual gifts that match and meet the field that he placed you in. Don't we use the term mission field? In the military, don't they have field exercises? It's the place where you work. It's the place where God puts you. Isn't the field also a place where a battle is fought? What is your field? You say, well, my field is just a bunch of weeds and grass. Good, you have a good opportunity. <laughs> You have an excellent opportunity to be different and unique and peculiar and beautiful in your field. The Bible says all flesh is grass, Isaiah 40. In Matthew chapter 13, the field is the world. And so you live in a field full of a bunch of grass. Psalm 103, 15, as for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. But you're a little different than the flower of the field. You're a little different than the grass that surrounds you in the field. Because Song of Solomon 2 said, My beloved is mine, I am his, he feedeth among the lilies. You know what the lilies are? Again, they're a picture of the person that is special to God, whether it be a tribulation saint or you today in this church age, that God desires to spend time feeding and supping and fellowshipping with in the field. He desires to fellowship with you because there's something different about your beauty and your fragrance, and the variety, and the color that he says, I find that special. You know, the Lord doesn't get that from the world. 
Psalm 37, 1, he says, The workers of iniquity shall soon be cut down as the grass and wither as the green herb. One day it gets mown down and thrown away and burned up in the oven. If then God so clothe the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not he clothe you, O ye of little faith? The Lord takes some special pleasure in you being similar to the grass of the field, because you both grow in the same place, but there's something that he enjoys about you. In Malachi chapter 4, he says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. I said it earlier, what destroys and judges and burns up the grass is joy and life and health and sustenance and beauty. That same sunshine that destroys the grass gives you life and health and radiance. It just matters who you are. In the dry season, these leaves out west, they're designed by the Creator to store up water to sustain them. You say, I would rather grow back east where there's plenty of water. You know, back east, this just happens to be the case. There is a church on every block in my hometown. There's a big old church just, uh, oh man. I'm just thinking of one after another all over the place. If you go down south, there's a church on every block. Lots of moisture. Lots of place to get the washing of the water of the word. There's lots of places there to get ministered and to get fed, and you find scripture all over the place, and then you move out west, and there's more bars than there are churches in any small town in Montana. It's dry out here. It's dry. You say, what do you do in the dry seasons? Well, you consider the lilies. What do the lilies do? They have a leaf that curls up, and when that leaf curls up during the day, only during the day, it blocks the sun from sucking the moisture out of the leaf, and then at the end of the day, it opens back up to receive the little bit of moisture overnight and the dew that comes in the morning. The leaves curl up to hold on to that water. Some leaves have hair on the leaves to protect the, from the wind. Isn't it windy out here? To protect the wind from drawing and wicking the moisture away from them. Some of the lilies out west, they only bloom at night. Who sees those? I guess the guy with the flashlight and God. Who even sees the lilies that bloom at night? You say, preacher, I have such troubles in my life. I even struggle coming to church and facing other Christians. Well, maybe you're that type of lily that blooms at night. And you need fellowship and we need your fellowship. But uh, we also can have grace with each other. If that's the only time you can bloom and you take the moisture that you can get in the dry areas and you find a way to hold on to it and maintain it. Like in 1 Samuel, the word of God was precious in those days. There was no open vision. What did you have to do? You had to hold on to whatever little bit you got because it's very precious. You say, man, I've been dry and been dehydrated and had problems finding the moisture and the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Well, is it precious to you when you have it? Or do you take it for granted and just say, oh, it'll rain again someday and go back to your dry state? How do you get a hold of the moisture of the Word of God? Does God get any pleasure with you out of spending time fellowshipping with you? Does God get any pleasure out of watching you soak up that moisture and appreciate it when you haven't had it in a long, long time? One day, uh, my wife and I bought a house and we went, signed all the papers, 11 o'clock, we got the keys to move in. We had everybody scheduled in the church to help us uh, move all our stuff out of the trailer and into the house. I got off work early that day, but I was pretty tired. I don't remember what I was doing and I came home feeling dirty, needing a shower, didn't have any, you know, stuff to, to, to take a shower or clothes to change into, everything's packed up. And I said, I just want to find a corner in this house and just lay down somewhere and rest while the ladies, you know, get, get their uh, plans figured out to move in. Well, we had seen the house before, but when we saw the house before, the former owners had the air conditioning running the whole time and uh, we didn't think much of it because it was summertime. And they were smokers, and we knew they were smokers, but we didn't know they smoked like chain smoking in the house smokers. So no air conditioners are running, the house is pretty much empty, and I show up there and just about hits you like a wall, and I couldn't even <coughs> breathe, and we opened all the windows and said, this place is filthy, we did not even notice it. 
when we did the walkthrough. <coughs> and I said, well, let's change plans here. And all the ladies went and got cleaning supplies instead of unpacking. They spent hours cleaning the walls and cleaning the ceilings and the cupboards and the carpets. And I walked around that house and said, I just need to lay down for a minute. I'll be fine if I can just lay down for half an hour or so. And I went into one room and the floor was a filthy hardwood floor. Kitchen linoleum needed cleaned. I went into another room and most of the house was carpet. And in every room I said, I cannot lay down here. This house is dirtier than I am after working construction all day. I said, it's not the end of the world. We can clean, but it's going to take some time. There's nowhere for me to lay down, and I just said, oh, I'm going to take a walk instead. So I walked across Broadwater and walked down a block and took a turn, took a turn. And As I was walking, I could sit, take you to the block today, just six blocks that direction. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking, you know, I wonder if the Lord has this trouble ever with Christians. I wonder if the Lord ever has this trouble with me. Just wants to dwell in my heart, be in a clean place, sit down, take a rest, maybe take a nap and just hang out there, but it's too filthy for him to really enjoy any fellowship and get any rest in that place. I thought, man, how many times has that been me? Does the Lord get any pleasure out of you being different than all the grass of the field? Because without a flower <clears throat> on your stem, you look just like the rest of the field. I could read you about the lilies that have grass-like stems. Multiple, multiple lilies. What do they look like? With Minus the flower, they look just like the grass of the field. But inside that same stem, with no flower on it, has the potential, the DNA, the incorruptible seed of the Word of God to bloom and to blossom into something beautiful that the world does not have. And the Lord desires some beauty from you. Number three, consider their fashion. That is the context of the considering your clothing. He shall clothe you as the grass of the field, neither do they spin. He uses the word raiment in the passage. And I know that this world is very concerned with their fashion. I know that many Christians are very concerned with their fashion. Some Christians, they consider what Hollywood wears before they consider what they wear. Because of the influence of YouTube and magazines and Facebook and Instagram, even out west, where we're kind of not a big city and not really kept keeping up with New York and Hollywood and Los Angeles fashion, even small town America is able to follow the big city trends because of the connection of the internet. And all the world's keeping up with each other on how, how fashionable they can be. And the Lord said, I have a different fashion in mind for you. The lilies have an intrinsic fashion and a beauty and a color and a variety that this world can't get a hold of. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord. Feareth the Lord, there's a beauty. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. There's a beauty, virtue. You know what lilies have? They have this ability to be beauty and beautiful in a way that the world doesn't see. If you mark 2 Corinthians 5, consider their fashion or their clothing. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, the Lord talks about your clothing. In verse 1, it says, For we know that if our earthly house, our earthly house, he's talking about your body, the one you live in on earth, if the earthly house of this tabernacle, our body, were dissolved, when a man dies, he loses this body, and he goes on to heaven in his soul. His soul goes to a different place. If we lose this earthly house and this tabernacle, and it's dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. He said, Isaac, I thought we were talking about clothing. Oh, we are. Verse 2, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be, what's the next word? Clothed. Upon with what? Our house. The Lord says your house is your clothing, which is from heaven. And if so, that being clothed, obviously we shall not be found naked. Do you want to be clothed in heaven? I do. <laughs> if you don't want to admit it, I do. <laughs> you see, where does that clothing come from in heaven? Didn't the Lord say, I go to prepare a place for you? 
Jesus the carpenter said, I'm going to build a mansion up there, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you. In my Father's house are many mansions. What are, you, what are you wearing in heaven? Somehow you're wearing your building, your house, your tabernacle, all those overlapping things in Scripture. I cannot figure out the end of them, but they're interwoven with gold and silver and precious stones in the priest's garments and in the priest's tabernacle in the Old Testament. How does that all work? It's a heavenly design that you will not understand until you have the eyes and the understanding of the Lord. But it's pictured as clothing, fashionable clothing. Verse 4, for that we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Amen, amen. Hmm, hmm. Hmm, I don't even want to think about how much I groan in this tabernacle. Being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. I'm not burdened in this life so that I can live all the next life without a proper tabernacle. I'm burdened and groaning in this tabernacle, trying to do something for the Lord so that in the next life I have some clothing to wear that's fine garments, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The king daughters are all glorious within, for she is clothed in wrought gold. Who in the world is that in Psalm 45? It's the king's daughters. You know, in the Old Testament, they would take gold and they would hammer it out into sheets, and then somebody with a pair of scissors or a sharp knife would cut a zigzag all through that thinly hammered out gold. As fine as they could cut it, as fine as they could hammer it. It probably took hours and hours and hours, and when they got all done, they would stretch that gold out into a wire, or rather a thread, and they would take that thread and they would stitch it into the priest's garments. Some valuable garments. I thought, man, that's a strange thing. Who does that today? And I was in the airport one day, and they had this, you know, they got this clothing, this um, Expedia or X, X something clothing, and uh, it's supposed to be like two sets of underwear and three continents in 14 days. Anybody ever seen this stuff in the airport? I'm the only one that notices underwear in the airport. Okay. <laughs> caught my attention because it said 14 days of traveling and two sets of clothes and I picked up one of these to read it and it's under clothes that you can have two pair and wash one in your hotel or wherever you end up staying right and you can have clean clothes and I read the the uh, materials what materials they put in it and one of the materials was silver interwoven into the clothing and when the silver is interwoven it has a natural anti antibacterial property that keeps it from stinking and keeps it from being gross and it naturally fights off germs. What is that? Gold, silver, and precious stones being woven into the clothing. They'll catch up to the Bible someday, <laughs> right? You know what you have? At the judgment, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, we have wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. What are they thrown into the fire, and they come out purer when they're purified by heat? And what does that go into? It goes into your building which is your house, which is your clothing. You have a spiritual fashion that's going to last you for eternity up in heaven. And lilies have a fashion. I thought, man, do these lilies, any of these lilies have any clothing? The whole context is clothing. There's got to be clothing in here somewhere. And I found the taper tip onion. It's in the lily family and it has a small edible bulb. The taper tip onion has a cousin, the textile onion, and it has a persistent fibrous coating around the bulb. In the book, it was called a thick brown netted coat. I didn't know lilies had clothing. I bet you didn't either. I thought my wife has a thick brown netted coat. She has a couple of them now. Looks pretty nice on her. You know what you have in the lilies as a picture? You have the lilies being clothed and fashionable, and you have a spiritual fashion that's pleasing to the Lord or pleasing to the world. 1 Corinthians 7, it says, The fashion of this world passeth away. You say, man, I want to look sharp today. I do too. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's nothing wrong with owning nice things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. In Philippians 3, He will change our vile body that it may be fashioned, fashioned like unto His glorious body. 1 Corinthians 3.9, ye are God's building. 1 Corinthians 6.19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God, and you're not your own. 2 Peter 2, yea, I think it meet, Peter said, as long as I am in this tabernacle, 
to stir you up by putting you into remembrance. You know what I like to do as a preacher? I like to get people stirred up. You ever have that co-worker guy that's always stirring the pot for all the wrong reasons, just stirring the pot, keeping everybody on their toes, keeping everybody angry at each other? I'm not talking about that kind of stirred up. I'm talking about stirring up for the Lord, that getting people into spiritual conversations about the preaching from the week. I love hearing about that when I hear reports of your co-worker conversations on the job site or in the office place or in the wherever you work. Peter said, knowing this shortly, I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. And to her was granted, Revelation 19, that she should be arrayed, arrayed in fine linen, just like the lilies and just like Solomon. Fine linen, clean and white. You know, that spiritual clothing is not fashioned with physical hands. Your physical hands can't make that clothing. Tom Malone said, if all you have today is what you can touch with your two hands and see with your two eyes, then you are pitifully poor. The work of God is not done by Christians' hands, but by Christians' hearts. Paul said at the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4, there is henceforth laid up for me a crown of righteousness. You know what the Lord said you should be looking forward to? You should be putting your affections on things above and not on things of this earth, and find some spiritual fashion that will last you for eternity. Number four, last one, finally, consider their future. Consider the future of the lilies. These lilies are uh, perennial. some of them. Perennial is the Latin word probably. It literally means through the years. So any plant that grows more than two years, this isn't news to most of you ladies, but any plant that grows more than two years, men, is called a Perennial means it lasts, or per- perennial. It lasts through the years. But you know what I know about all lilies that you know about all lilies? All lilies one day will die. They may have a dormant season and come back in the spring, but eventually that particular lily will die and never grow back again on this earth. But don't you uh, go out sometimes and uh, you see a lily there growing and you you pick that flower, and you say, I'm going to make this flower die. I mean, you don't think that, but that's what you do. <laughs> I'm going to take this flower's life. And you pluck it from the stems. Hannah does this more than anybody I know. <laughs> and you say, this lily is not going to bring pleasure to anyone else, because I just plucked it from its environment, but it is going to bring pleasure to me. Maybe you'll take that home and put it in a, a vase and put some water in there and some little plant food and... They never seem to grow very long that way, but they do last a couple days, don't they? And they have some beauty that is really selfish of you. <laughs> it's really individual and personal, the pleasure that you get from that lily that nobody along the path you plucked it from is able to enjoy any longer. But you thought it was worth it to bring pleasure to you. And the Lord sometimes looks down here and he says, I think I like that one. Look, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The Lord says, I'll take that one to keep for me. And the Lord keeps it growing up there forever. You know what you can do? All you can do. After that, Lily has outlived its vase you can take it out of the vase and for some reason we hang them upside down on a string right in some cool dry place I did this with my carnations or roses or something one time in my life never done it again they're real special those flowers and that girl that I can't remember her name (laughs) hung them upside down and saved them for a while and They dried out and kept their color. Or maybe you've taken two pieces of wax paper and put it in a dictionary or an encyclopedia, Mm -hmm. if you still have one of those, and put that flower and you crush it in that place there. And you say, now nobody's going to get to look at it except me whenever I want to. As a what? 
as a memorial of something that's special attributed to that flower. <clears throat> and you come back years later, come back years later and you open up that book and you say there's that flower and there's that memory. And the first couple times you open that up, if you get, if you have a real sensitive nose, can't you still catch a little bit of that fragrance of that flower as what? As a memory of something that you pressed between two pages of the book. And you know that fragrance comes out of a flower. Doesn't it come out of that flower more when you take it between your hands and crush it? You get all that fragrance condensed into one place. Or you buy those little drops of pure natural oil, right? The hippie oils, and there's like, this is all natural. It's 10 million flowers crushed down to 47 drops. It's so natural. How did that, how do they get those oils out of that plant? By crushing it through a process. You say, God, I don't want to go through any trouble in my life. And the Lord says, if I'm going to get fragrance out of you that's pleasing to me, you will have to be crushed. And the Lord desires the beauty and the fragrance and the fashion and your frailty to come to His glory and to His pleasure through whatever means He chooses, whether it's plucking and storing or pressing or crushing, the Lord desires to get pleasure out of your life. Would you consider the frailty of the lilies? Would you consider your field that God's called you in? Would you consider your fashion and your future? Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in order of prayer. Lord, I ask that you would please bless the word of this message this morning. Lord, I ask you to help us to consider our field, to consider the place where you put us. Lord, some of us were raised here, some of us chose to live here, some of us really enjoy the climate and the seasons of this place in Montana. And I see a lot of similarities in the flowers that grow here. Lord, I ask you to help us to be different from the world and different from the grass that surround us. There's no shortage of weeds and grasses. It's going to be one day burned up. Lord, if there's somebody here that's going to be burned up in the oven of your wrath one day, there's no shortage of verses on your wrath in Scripture that is for lost men. Or if there's somebody here today that needs to get saved and would humble himself and become like a flower and say, Lord, I am frail, and I don't bring any beauty to you without your help and without your supernatural conversion from grass to a flower, Lord, ask that that person would come to you today and not delay any longer, not risk the chance and possibility of going to hell. Lord, I ask that you please uh, help us Christians here that uh, if there's anybody here that has a, a heart that's so uh, dirty and gross and defiled that the Lord couldn't even come in there and get some rest. Lord, I ask you to help them to get out the simple green and the Lysol and do some scrubbing and do some cleansing and ask for your help in that cleaning up process. And as you help us this morning to consider these things wherever you spoke to us, and take a minute or two here while the piano plays.
let's close. We'll be dismissed with the two lines of the song number 466. We sang it already this morning. 466. We'll sing the second verse and the third verse with the chorus on each. Number 466. We'll start on the second verse. Amen. All right. Have a good afternoon.